such a beautiful day indeed, Shahbaz. And uh, we have foreign guests here as well, uh, our Chinese friends, our Malaysian friends, and our Pakistani uh, community that has gathered today here. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, thank you very much for being here today with us, for celebrating our Independence Day. Uh, you would have noticed, uh, those, those of you who have not been in Pakistan before, that uh, this is the biggest day that Pakistan as a nation has. So I'll, I'd like to tell you a bit of background of why we celebrate this day. In this part of the world, which we call subcontinent, and which consists of uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India, this is a huge area, you know. You see, it, it, on the one side is the Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, and on the other side is Himalayan Mountains. So it has been a geographically one unit for centuries and centuries. It has been just one big geographical unit. With not necessarily one political identity, but, but big one geographical unit. So at various times, before Pakistan came into being, various political entities tried to unite it, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. The last such entity that made that great endeavor was the British imperial power in subcontinent. And by 1900, even by, I would say, a bit before that, they were able to largely consolidate this entire geographic area as one political unit. And as one political unit, it had seldom been in this form and shape under one political power. So when the British were thinking of leaving this country, people who had lived not necessarily together started thinking of what would be after the British would leave. And at that time, while there were other, other identities like ethnic identities, linguistic identities, and even regional identities, there were two major identities and in this part of the world, uh, with, with one was the Hindu identity. There was this large population of Hindus in this part of the world, which at that time was around 75%. And there was another Muslim identity, that was 25% of the total population. And there was a huge debate whether this country would remain united or this country would eventually be divided on these lines. Even within Muslims there was a debate whether we should go for a separate homeland or we should not. Our forefathers at that time decided to have a separate homeland and it was not an easy thing to do. There were a lot of struggles, there were a lot of sacrifices that were given in the process of getting a separate Muslim homeland in subcontinent. And today, 70 years on, we know for sure that there is no doubt, either in our minds or in the minds of Muslims who still are left behind in India, that this was the best possible decision that could be taken in 1947 to have a separate Muslim homeland. And I, for, for, for our friends who are here and who, have, uh, who might be reading all, uh, about all this, I would, I would only just give you two examples. There are two areas in the world where Muslims went as a dominant political power and they were co-living with a majority of population that was non-Muslim. One is Spain and other is subcontinent Indian subcontinent. So in Spain, Muslims did not try to carve out a separate area for themselves, a separate homeland. And eventually, all Muslim power, including population, was converted by force into Christianity and they have since have been living as Christians in that part of the world. So this was the historical frame in which the generation, the generation of Alama Iqbal and Qadiyazum was thinking about the future of Muslims in this part of the world. And they did not want that the same fate should occur to the Muslims of subcontinent, which at that time was a huge population as it is today. Today, Muslims constitute something like uh, 
I would say 450 million or 500 million people in subcontinent alone. And this is the single largest Muslim concentration anywhere in the world. So even at that time, in a proportional term, they were a big, big community. So our forefathers faced this question, whether we would be ruled by a Hindu majority or we would have a separate homeland. At that time, there were a lot of arguments that, A, this is not really an issue, you know, even if the Hindus are 75%, you can have your own share, but our forefathers at that time were wise enough to see through the future. And I'll give you one example of that. Today, in Pakistan, Muslims live, around 200 million live, uh, Muslims live in Pakistan. Exactly the same number of Muslims actually today live in Uttar Pradesh, which is one province of India. Uh, not Muslims, total population of Uttar Pradesh is 200 million, including Hindus and Muslims. And 20% of those uh, people who live in Uttar Pradesh are Muslims, which is around 40 million people. 40 million is not, not a small number, 4 crore. It is as large as 10 province. So that is the number of Muslims they live. And in 2017, we just we are just finished in March with elections for the legislature of UP. And we saw that the ruling coalition which won 321 out of 400 seats in the UP Assembly, not a single Muslim candidate was fielded by them. Not a single Muslim candidate. Winning and losing is another thing. They just decided not to field a single Muslim candidate. So time has also proved that the decision that we took, the decision that our forefathers took, at that point in time, was correct. Just to give you a bit more of that, There's, those of you who are uh, interested in reading, you can go to one of these in, in, interesting reports compiled in India about the state of Indian Muslims. And that is where you best get the reason the Atre for getting Pakistan. If you really want to understand why we needed this country, look and see the plight of the Muslims now living in India. And they are living like outcasts, like people who are under subjugation, people who have been marginalized, people who do not have education, people do not have an opportunity in life. Opportunity of life is the most basic fundamental right that a child is born with. And just across the border, it's not even a few kilometers away from it, on the, on the eastern side, you can see that that opportunity is even today denied to as large a Muslim population, almost as large, as much is living in Pakistan. So this is the day that we celebrate and uh, we are proud of it that we were able to get a separate homeland on 14th of August. Uh, I just want to uh, take a bit, bit back into history and see that this, this country is a precious gift for the people living in this part of the world. And this is a precious gift that we have been defending with our toil, with our sweat, with our blood. And uh, I, I believe we have invited some of the families here today who, who have actually sacrificed their blood for defending this country in one form or another. Rather defending against the terrorists who are our inside enemies, just, just like outside enemies, they are inside enemies, so they have been fighting them. Or against anti-social forces, or the Dekais and others, so I believe uh, there are a few families from the police force and from uh, Pakistan army, the, uh, the men and men who have sacrificed their lives for this country, for us, for the reason and for the fact that today we can peacefully celebrate it, they have actually given out their lives. So uh, once that comes, I request Jai uh, to invite them in, in that sequence. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful thoughts and a new insight to the uh, independence. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's celebrate this day uh, by starting with a wonderful performance from Army Band. 